All right, 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM listeners, we got a one-on-one exclusive video interview with one of my personal favorite actors that I grew up watching since I was a young boy, man. We got the one and only hip-hop artist, producer, actor. This man is a jack-of-all-trades in and out of Hollywood. We got Omar Gooding right here live, on, live, man. How are you doing this evening? Oh, man, I'm blessed and highly favored, man. Thanks for having me on. Hey, man, you are most certainly welcome, man. Like I said, I've been a fan for a long time, so honestly, man, thank you again respect but i know you're a busy guy man you know you're shooting a lot of movies you know you're yeah. keeping busy so i'm gonna dive right into this man but i want to take you back to when you were just 14 man in the year mm. 1990 mm. where you actually starred alongside uh co- comedic legend bill cosby in the classic movie ghost dad man i gotta yeah. ask how how did that opportunity come to be and just being able to work alongside bill cosby man it was dope because um you know i was fairly new in the business uh, so that was like my first big audition. Um, and the first time that I read for them, I read for the great Sidney Poitier, who was the director. And um, I was in the audition room for like 20 some odd minutes. It felt like an hour. He had me crawling on the tables and, and, and peeking behind chairs and doing all these you know, facial expressions and whatnot. So when I left that, I was like, I know I booked it. But they told me that they were moving on without me. Like I, I, I wasn't getting another call for it. And um, my momager, said, let me call down there and just see, you know, <laughs> it's like not really standard protocol to have your, uh, your manager call straight to the casting agent. But she calls, she says, you know, I just want to figure out why, you know, uh, my son wasn't moving on. If there was any direct feedback so we would know. And uh, they said, hold on a second. They talked about it for a minute, got back on. They said, you know what? We're going to bring him back into screen test. And I went back in and screen test and I booked the thing, man. And I tell you, it was a blessing, man. Meeting Bill Cosby after watching him on the Cosby show. Uh, you know, I was just as starstruck as anybody who would meet him especially at, you know, that age. And um, he was really cool, man. You know, he knew how to just take all the nerves away, treat you like a regular person, uh, you know, which helped. You know what I mean? I know when I act with, like, either kids or other people that seem a little nervous, a little on edge because of who I am or whatever the situation is, I always want to get them calm and relaxed, um, if not for selfish reasons. So make sure that this tape goes smooth so we don't have to do, like, 1,200 takes because you're nervous. But, uh, no, but he was was real cool, man, and filming that was uh, something I'll always remember. And I got to say as well, man, I think every kid that actually grew up in the 90s, man, like watch Ghost Dad at least once or twice in their <laughs> life, man. And I don't know I have... if every kid saw because it didn't do that well. It, uh, Yeah, the box office success was not it. It was not it. But some people saw. Some... <laughs> see, I, I got to say, though, man, like I, me personally, when, I, when it came out, I wasn't really looking at sales and whatnot. I enjoyed it I when I was a kid, man. Still, still an instant yeah. classic. And the one thing I have to ask, man, when we're on the topic of Ghost Dad, mm-hmm. how, how, did they guys, how did you guys do the actual, like, obviously Bill Cosby, a ghost, you can see through him. Was that like a green screen? Because I know this was like early, early, early 90s. Yeah, I'm trying to think. For that, I remember that there were a lot of like, like the dummies where we would just kind of follow it around. Like they would say, look here, that type of thing. Um, I believe there was some green screen, but not a lot. A lot of it was just kind of like, look off this way type of thing. Like he's here, act like he's there. We'll put something here for it. Okay, this is follow the little ball. That's him. That's you know, that's okay. <laughs> but also as well, in the same year, nineteen ninety, uh, from from to the year nineteen ninety two, you were actually one of the original hosts, actually on the Nickelodeon TV show <laughs> Wild and Crazy Kids. I was wondering yeah. how did you actually land that role, and of course, what was it like just hosting that iconic kids show? It was fun, man. I mean, you know, people ask questions like that, like, what was it like? You know, it's like me being an actor my entire life. It just seemed normal to me. You know, having a father who was a singer, mother who was a singer, father that had success, you know, a brother that wins an Oscar. All of that is just my life to me. So it wasn't like, oh, my God, this is amazing. I can't believe this is happening. I figured, you know, there were other kids doing the same thing. Um, the audition, it was driven by um, financial need uh, more than anything because we were homeless at the time. You know, quick backstory. My father was a singer in the 70s, uh, a, a group called The Main Ingredient. He had hits like Everybody Plays the Fool, Just Don't Want to Be Lonely. And uh, when I was born, the year I was born, he went out to South Africa uh, during apartheid. When he came back, he got blacklisted. So um, all his sales dropped, All of the, a lot of money. We lost a lot of finances, lost the house, uh, the cars, all that. And um, my mother took my brother, my sister, and myself, and a large great thing, and uh, we went to live with her mother while my father went back to New York. Now, I understand this, too. I was born in California. My brother, my sister, my father, my mother, they're all born in New York. You know, So they moved out to California uh, while we still had money. And, uh, <laughs> but I turned five. That's when we started to lose it. And then you know, for the like, next couple of years, we were, we were homeless. You know? So 
when I had the opportunity to audition for Wild and Crazy Kids, I knew what I was doing it for. It wasn't like, hey, this is some hobby. Let's see what it is. I was really driven to get my mom from the two jobs she was working and, uh, you know, try to help pay for the apartment that we had just recently been able to afford. Um, so, you know, the good thing about the, what my mom and my father did is all of us, all of us, our siblings, were able to, you know, we had clear diction from a young age. You know what I mean? We always spoke well. You know, we they never did baby talk. It wasn't like, God, God, ba ba, none of that. You know, it was just like, how are you? I'm fine. Are you hungry? Yes, mom. Can I please have, you know what I mean? So when I audition for these roles and they see a kid come in smiling from ear to ear with straight West Indian teeth, uh, no braces. Okay. Um, they were like, you know, when I opened my mouth, they were already like, oh man, this kid, first of all, there's a lot of lines. <laughs> you got to describe a lot of stories and a lot of, a lot of games rather, and you know, all the rules and blue team, yellow team, all that, you know what I mean? So I was just a natural at that type of thing, man. So, um, so I, I nailed that and it was, you know, rest was history, baby. And I got to say as well, Nickelodeon back then was huge. Like I, I would still say it is today, but like, of course, kids now are all on their cell phones and whatnot. Yeah, so cartoons that. aren't really as big, man. But Nickelodeon was the mm -hmm. shit back in the day, man, especially Absolutely. in the 90s. Absolutely. Yeah, man, I watched Double Dare and all that, man. I couldn't, you know, I was excited to be on it. So it was fun. It's like the first year was like, oh, shit, I'm on Wild. You know, I got my own, my own TV show and we're coming up with these games. And, and it kind of, you know, evolved from year to year um but it was work you know what i mean like first couple of years was kind of fun yeah i was like whoa but about the third year i was just like okay come on now you can't stop playing and throwing the blood all right i gotta read all these lines <laughs> i do no cue cards i'm trying to memorize all this so um so it was a lot but you know I, it was one of those things where you just powered through it and then afterwards you reflected on it and it was like damn like i look at pictures now like you know we went to arnold schwarzenegger we met arnold schwarzenegger in, the, in dc you know what i mean on the steps of the wall like it was it was it was really some fun stuff you know, a lot of people I'll meet be like, you know, I was on that show. Like, get the hell out of here. Like, yeah. Then they show me a picture of me holding the L. So, uh, so no, it was definitely an experience. And that was just the beginning. You feel me? And the, uh, one other show I want to bring up, and, and I know you, I know, I know a lot of interviewers always bring this show up. And when I say that, you probably know what I'm getting into. So I don't want to make the whole interview about that, but smart guy, man. The one thing <laughs> I have, the one thing I have to ask me is that's another show I grew up on watching, man. Hey. You know, I, I still watch the reruns today, man. I really do. Yeah. I, I just watched the one. Today, actually, uh, where you guys actually started up a barbershop and whatnot. Hilarious. Yeah. Man, it's a lot. But see, now, the reason why I have to I have to take you back for a second is because when you bring up a specific episode, it's really difficult to, to lock in on, like, yeah, do you remember that? Do you not? I remember a couple of them. But dig this. We did Wild and Crazy Kids. We did three seasons of that, 25 episodes a season, roughly. So we did, like, 75 episodes of that, right? Immediately after Wild and Crazy Kids ends, I booked Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Now, I was on Hanging with Mr. Cooper the entire five seasons. We had 100 plus episodes on that, right? After that, one of the executive producers that used to be on Hanging with Mr. Cooper started Smart Guy, right? Then we did three seasons of that, 25 episodes a season. You know what I mean? That's another 75 episodes. You feel me? And by then, I'm like 24 years old. You know what I mean? I started, you know, nine, 10 years old. And then you blink, you're 24. You've done three, you know, major tv shows and i'm trying to reflect on each one um but i was blessed at an early age man that just especially starting off in this business and to book like that you know what i mean so i had tv show tv show tv show and then you know i'll let you ask the question on what comes next but smart guy was definitely dope i mean it was that's when i really started to feel stardom and stuff like you know what i mean like oh, yeah. wild and crazy kids we filmed during the summer so it was just like a little summer gig and then go, take your butt back to school hang with mr cooper I was in high school, junior high through high school, right? And I wasn't a series regular. So I talk about the 100 episodes we did, but I, I was only on about 60 or so episodes, but I was always back and forth. And then the last two seasons, I was a series regular on that. And then when uh, Smart Guy hit, you know, now I've moved out, got my own place, you know what I mean? And uh, as a young man with money and, you know, stardom and stuff, then I was able to feel it. We had Destiny Child and all these people that came on the show, like, you know what I mean, Tyrese, all these cats that came in before their careers really took off. Um, but it was still a big deal, you know what I mean? So, so yeah, hat, hats off to them. And that was definitely an experience that I'll never forget. And the one thing I have to ask, man, because I'm, I'm, I, I, me personally, I say unfortunately because, you know, mm. the people think an era can come back. As you already know, there's making reboots and whatnot. Mm. I have to ask, man, if, if someone was to come to you and be like, hey, we want to bring Smart Guy back with the original <laughs> cast, would, would you mm. actually do – would you do that? Um, First response is yes, absolutely. Um, I would do it um, 
because I mean, I would there, obviously there's a lot of stipulations on my part as I just would the writing would have to be as good as if not better as the original. You understand what I'm saying? Like oh, the yeah. writers on that show were phenomenal, no matter how you cut it or slice it. You watch a show now, I don't care how old you are, what you'll laugh. You're like, damn, these writers were pretty good. And they were. We did not do a lot of improv on that show. Like some shows, you say, oh, man, that show was funny. I know that was you. When you put that in there, that was your little spin. Yeah, I put my own flavor and my isms. And I was always good working with my face and facial expressions. And I was always Mr. King of the one line anyway. So I knew how to make the most out of every line. So if you give me a couple of lines, it's over with. you know. So that was that was great. We all added our own thing to it. But the, the scripts just had us belly laughing. You know what I mean? So we would really have to have somebody that knew what they were doing uh, that was a fan of the show, if not worked on the show as a writer for the show. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and I, you know, I'm sure that cast, uh, you know, we got Jason Weaver and, and, um, and Taj and, and, and Essence and my man, JJ, we we're all seasoned actors. I'm sure we could improv and do some things to make it kind of bring back the nostalgia. And I think most of us as fans of the show will probably just be happy to see us all side by side, you know, but, um, for me to really, you know, sink into it, I, I just, I, the writing would just have to be strong. So I'm saying. I most definitely agree, you know, because it's it's gonna be really hard. Even if they if they do do something like that, I think mm. it would be very difficult for them to actually match what you guys did back from like '97 to '99, man. Like you, that show was you'd have phenomenal. To put, you'd have to put a new twist on it because whether you are a fan of Marcus and Moe or you like Essence or the Dad or just simply the fact that it was called Smart Guy about this cute ass little kid who was a boy genius. Who you know was able to out talk grown ups and you know what I'm saying as a kid you're just like this is awesome you know what I'm saying um, what can we duplicate now all right the older ones will still be you know we're all whatever whatever but that little kid ain't a little kid no more you know what I'm saying so if you want to see him grown cool so maybe if they come up and I did hear an idea that they were trying to put together one um, it was kind of a spin off type of thing like smart girl or something where he's grown up and he's got two little girls that are hella smart and that type of thing and then the old cast comes in to kind of join it we're like you know i was like all right that could work and again the writing would just have to be you know all that and uh the script i read was decent it was you know just keeping it 100 i'll ask anybody ask me i'll tell I'll, I'll, I'll keep it real i'll keep it real like they said uh and i read it and i said okay you know it could work um with some tweaking and a little bit of this and that so but i know they were trying to get a reboot off the ground um we'll see we'll see you never know Hey man, you never know. You never know, man. Hopefully, hopefully it does. That actually sounds pretty, pretty cool, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a pretty, pretty decent show. Yeah, why not? But also, as well, this this question, this next question is actually for the the older viewership. Majority of the ladies, as well, because I, I, me personally, I never met a guy that really watched this show. But Go touched ahead. by an angel, man. You were actually on really? one of the, one of the episodes, man. Oh, brought me back. <laughs> bring, oh, bring yeah, back. touched by an angel. Yeah, Della Reese and them. Yeah, that was awesome, man. That was. I remember. The audition for that show, because um, that was a drama, you know what I mean? That was a drama, drama. But when I, my role, I played a um, a kid that played baseball. One thing that I'm sticking my mind, because I couldn't play baseball worth a lick, but I was a pitcher. And um, anyway, we'll get to that part in a second. Uh, the audition, I remember, I wasn't really good with my emotions. I, I, I With my past and my background, comedy was easy, because I loved to laugh. And I'll, I'll use comedy as a shield if I'm going through some deep shit. You know what I mean? Um, but when it came to actually showing your emotions on like sadness, I'd kind of get locked up. I'd have the facial expression. So, oh, man, you feel it, you know, but the tears sometimes just wouldn't fall. So I remember clearly this audition where I saw the sides for it and I was at home practicing it. And I went through the emotions. The tears are coming down my face. And I'm like, oh, I'm a nail this. And I remember I went into the audition and as I'm reading it and I'm going through it and I'm pushing it, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, come on, man, let it, you know, me be natural and let it let them fall. But I'm, I'm just I'm wearing it on my face. But I remember when the scene ended, my face was dry and I was thinking, damn, I didn't cry. That's kind of interesting. And then I then I glance up and look at the casting director and he's just bawling like his <laughs> tears are all dripping down his cheeks. He said, well, damn, man, that was great. And I was like, well, damn, that's interesting, you know. Um, and then filming it was fucking awesome. It was awesome, you know. And then in the, in the, you see if you flash back and actually see it, you're like, no, he was crying. I was crying. There's some techniques some people use after so many takes where they go, you know, that's the first time I saw that before. I was like, did they just, what are they doing over there? Because I'm over here working up some real tears and I'm seeing them doing techniques and they're like blowing menthol in people's eyes and stuff. I was like, what the hell? I was like, y'all cheating? Like, no, just after the first couple takes. 
And it's funny because I laugh at that, but I did a movie just recently and it got deep. And, uh, you know, we're talking and I was the girls on her deathbed and I'm, cr- and I'm crying, right? And I'm, tears are coming down my face and I'm screaming and she's wiping up my face. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, all right, we're going to do uh, <laughs> the next take and we're going to get the close up this time. I was like, mother, what was the take that y'all did? You know, it was a wide shot. It was great, though. Can you do that again? I was like, no, my, t- <laughs> my eyes is dry as hell now. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, it's tough. Sometimes you, you use little tricks for the second and third take, but I'll never forget that. But um, yeah, the other story I was going to say about that was I remember I couldn't pitch a lick and they had a guy come in uh, and pitch for me. They was like, you can just throw a couple pitches. Just make it to the mound and we'll see if you can, if we can use your pitches or if we had to bring somebody in. I threw a couple in the dirt. They were like, nah, nah bring it. Come on, stretch. He was about seven foot five. He was whipping them things. But uh, yeah, no, that brought me back. I'm glad you brought that up. That's I don't get asked about that. <laughs> I always try and find those questions that not a lot of people ask about. Like me personally, no, man. When, and I appreciate you. When I when I was a kid, man, my mom's used to put that show on all the time. I was a kid, man. So I used to be like, I used to be like, oh man, touch my angel. Really, I don't want to watch this shit. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, like, you know what I mean. But but as an adult, you know what I mean. I'll, I'll say this publicly. As an adult, you know what I mean. If there's nothing else on TV, I'll kick back and watch Touch by an Angel. You okay. Know what I mean? Okay. You know? It's, you know your prerogative. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a good show. Really it, de- it definitely was. It definitely a classic. But mm-hmm. one, one of my favorite roles, this is what I've been excited to ask you about, man. Uh-oh. In, in 2010, the, the, mm. in two, 2010, you actually starred in, and I got to say, unfortunate, short-lived television series, Miami Medical, man, mm. where you actually played Tuck Brody. And I have to ask, man, how did that role come to be for you? And of course, what was it like just working alongside Ooh. legendary Jerry Bruckheimer? Oh, man, it was awesome. It was truly awesome. And it was, um, it was a gift. It was one of those gifts. I was in between series at the moment, um, just enjoying my money. And <laughs> and I, was, I, I wasn't in shape or nothing, man. I was just kind of like, it's 2010. You feel me? I started in like 89. Like, this is like where, you know, people have retired. You know what I mean? I, I was wondering which question you was going to ask next. And you jumped over some other stuff and went to 2010. I was like, oh, man, let me talk about 2010. I was big, man. I didn't have like I had kids or nothing. I was just me and wifey just hanging out, like just eating and drinking. You know I mean, and they called me and said, We got a show on CBS called Miami Medical. You play one of the doctors, actually the head nurse, but he's like a badass dude. So you think nurse, you thinking, oh shit. And then you see this dude, you're like, uh oh. And uh, we want you to play the head nurse. It's Jerry Bruckheimer. I'm like, say less. Just when do you want me on set? Or do I have to audition? They're like, no, it's a straight offer. And you start on Monday, and it was a Friday. I was like, damn. <laughs> Put the burger down, like you know what I mean, because actors, it's all about how you look and this and that. You know, you get preparation, you do your little diet, or whatever you got to do, and get right. But if you relax, we like fighters too. When this, we, we ain't got a fight plan. We, you know, we gonna relax, be our natural walking around weight. You know what I mean? So I say that to say, if you see it, I one thing I remember about the show is I was big as hell. I was, <laughs> I was big, I was round, <laughs> and we had a couple. Of, and it's funny is, I, I got in shape throughout the filming of it. Right. So there was an episode, spoiler alert, if you saw the short, the, the one off, um, I get shot and then he or actually stabbed, I believe. But then I make it and I come back and then they were talking about, oh, he's breathing heavy. Oh, he's doing push ups because he's getting ready. And I actually had like a few weeks off. And then that time I was, you know, getting right. So you'll see the change physically uh, <laughs> from the beginning to the end. But um, but but yeah, but, but what you asked about, like, come on now, Jerry Bruckheimer. Uh, he wasn't like on set every day, you know, it was just one of those when you know that's his show and then you see his stamp put on it afterwards. I mean, it was top notch all the way through, man. All the cast. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. Now, that was a tough show for me, too, because I'm really good. I pride myself on being able to memorize lines. And the thing with lines is it's easier if there's an action attached to the line. You know what I mean? I walk in the room, I have to sit down on on the couch, and then I gotta go over here and grab a beer. So the first line is, oh, this couch is comfortable. Man, there's any beers in this fridge? It's easy to remember that as you sit down and then walk to the fridge, you know what I'm saying? But when it's stuff like, you know, scalpel this and that, and the general, how many CCs, the, 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 just the medical jargon that you have to just retain was insane. And we did a lot of wonders. I don't know if you know what a wonder is. A wonder is when the camera, it's just one take, and it's usually something rather complicated. And it was a scene where everybody pretty much, I think the whole cast was in it. And it was one of those walking down the hallways and then a patient come up, another patient walk this way. And then one crosses in, sir, we got dread, man. Everybody runs down and then boom, and the ambulance show up. And then we drag the guy up the gun. And then it ends with another person crossing through and saying, we need you on the the other room. 
But it was one long ass take. And I remember everybody's like, come on, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that shit was like, whoo. Like every time we got through it, everybody would clap because there was so many moving parts that you had to. Yeah. So it was very impressive. And then we really went through like medical school for <laughs> like about two, three weeks. It's what it felt like before we even started. It's like you have to know uh, what you're reaching for, what you're talking about. And um, it was such a dope show, you know, and it was about uh, the golden hour. You know what I mean? So it was like you had to be on point. You know, and you would feel like people watching the show, especially if they were in the medical field at all, they'd be like, oh, that ain't right. No, no, they, these, this was on, they, they was on point. We had surgeons and doctors on hand go, mm -mm, that's not, no, 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 that one, yes, that's good. That's, <laughs> they would watch the playback and go, that was good. You guys, y'all nailed it. You know, or let's try that again. That's not believable. What did you grab there? No one would do that. No one would say that, that type of thing. So uh, yeah, Bruckheimer knows what he's doing, especially with attention to detail. So we, uh, we had a ball with that one. And I have to ask, man, how, how, when well, we're on the topic of this, man, like, Mm -hmm. Why did that show get canceled, man? Because personally, that show was, excuse my language, fucking phenomenal, man. Like, that show was I, Are you asking for the real? I got to take another sip of my water to tell you what happened. And it's funny that you didn't ask this about every one of my series, because I swear <laughs> everyone has a, everyone, every single one has a damn story. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. After what I've just said, where I explained the, the literal, the difficult the difficult difficulty level of difficulty in from an actor's point of view in pulling this off making it genuine remembering these lines the medical jargon of what we what like you know what i mean like you feel like you can do an operation for real or pull jump out of car and save somebody's life after you filmed two episodes of this fucking show but it was very difficult it was harder you know it felt like you were in school every single day and just acting and bring now you just that's just memorizing this and learning this then you have to bring your raw emotion to it. You know, there's act, you got to save somebody's life. There's crying. There's, and it was a drama. You know what I mean? It was like a comedy. We we're just, you know, having fun and laughing all day. So no bullshit. It was a lot of work on every single actor. And it was an ensemble cast. It wasn't like Doogie Howser, one guy, and he's got to, you know, just, you know, steal the show and do so forth and so on. Nah, we were all worked hard. So there's my excuse for one of the cast members snapping at the uh <laughs> at the very end um this is what i remember because i wasn't there i arrived on set after the incident happened and went to the trailer uh the makeup trailer and they were all buzzing and talking about oh man i can't believe that all right and they're like laughing and i'm like what what, what, what are you laughing about they said oh man blankety blank grabbed the executive producer and picked him up off the ground and screamed at him. I said, excuse me? What do you mean screamed at him? Well, he wanted to wear glasses in the scene. And he said, you can't wear fucking glasses. You What do you mean? Like you want like some, buy some reading glasses? No, he wanted to wear dark shades in there because of, I don't know, a headache, lighting, who knows? But they said, fuck no. This is the scene where you're telling the woman that her son, like, you know what I mean? This is a very emotional scene you can't have sunglasses are you okay and he said i said i'm wearing the glasses and picked them up off the ground and they're all telling me this story and laughing and shit and i'm like what the fuck is funny about that story that is canceled you don't grab the executive producer so i knew already and then, and then they put us where shows go to die friday night that's where you put a show i don't know any show that lasts on a friday night god bless you yeah you must you got to be strong but if you try to come out with a with a especially uh, uh, a medical show where the target audience is probably a little bit older than the kids that go, yeah, you, know, you know what I'm saying? It's like it's kind of in, in between. Like it's not really the older kids, but it was because it was a couple of young cats on there, rock stars. So we're like, oh, the young kids are gonna love this. How we dinner? Young kids ain't staying home on a Friday night to watch this, you know? So the ratings were like, you know, it was CBS. So it was like two million, four million. You know, you're like, oh, wow, four million. It's like, no, nah, it's not good, brother. <laughs> it needs to be 14, 20 something, like to, you know. So, but like I said, once I heard him, uh, once I heard about that incident, I already knew that it was downhill from there. I said, well, this ain't gonna last. Might as well go ahead and uh, uh, find the next gig. You feel me? I see. I remember that because I, I wasn't really like internet savvy back then, like in 2010. Mm -hmm. So, I, I was, right. I normally, whenever the show comes back on in the fall, I was waiting for it turned it on the same night the friday night and i was and i was like why the fuck is there fucking basketball on oh, <laughs> i was shit. legit like God what 
So then okay. they don't tell you when the show's canceled. Then you have to find it. You have to go look and you know, especially back then. You'd be like, oh, this was just released. Nah, nah, they'll just be you'd be waiting. Like you said, all right, here comes my show. Why well, ain't on yet? It's gotta be a new season. I remember I remember every couple, every couple, like every week I'd tune in and we need another show, and I'm just sitting yeah. there and I'm like, That was a they, good they show. cancel my fucking stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, man, I, it's funny, it's like I had I started off with three shows that went at least three seasons. Three seasons, five seasons, three seasons. You know, hits, icons, shows that everybody remembers. I grew up watching you, that type of thing. And then I went through a string of shows that were like one and done. That one was one. I did one called uh, Zoe that turned into Zoe Duncan, Jack and Jane for its second season, the one I entered, and then that got canceled. That's the only one I don't have a story on. That one that was a little weird. Some of the cast members were a little funky, like, I don't know. They weren't ex as happy to be working as I was. I was like, this is great. And they were like, hey, it could be better. I was like, no, canceled. <laughs> it was just like weird. I did a, a football series for ESPN that everyone, we always talk about this. That went one season as well. And there's a story behind that. But again, I'll let you, I'll let you run the interview. Um, and then I did another series that went nine years again. So, you know, it's like, I see you. I was a success early. Then it was one and done, one and done, which, you know, you can't complain about working, but, you know. It's one and done. It's, it's sometimes it's hard to explain. And I even notice as well with like TV networks, especially nowadays, man. Seasons, all seasons don't really last very long nowadays, man. Back in the mm -hmm. '90s, you could have like 14, 15, 16 long seasons. Now it's like mm -hmm. normally three to five, and it's gone and it's done. It's a and it's done. You know that's true too. And they've also gotten shorter too. Like a lot of these, uh, especially like the dramas and stuff, would be like 13 episodes. You know, uh, as opposed to 25 episodes. You know, what I mean, sitcoms back in the day. A little bit all right. But also as well, in 2012, you actually produced and starred mm -hmm. in the TV series, the uh, sorry, the Bounce TV series, Family Time. I was wondering yes, what actually made you decide to get into producing the producing mm -hmm. side of the television industry? A um, couple things, man. I mean, initially, you know, you start off as an actor. You always want to progress. You always want to get better. You want to improve. Um, you know, you start off as maybe you'll do a... Uh, an extra or you'll have a featured extra type of thing and then you'll get a co-starring and then you'll get a starring and then you'll get a lead and so what's next huh, you want to direct you want to produce um you want to write you know i've done so many projects i won't say so many but i've done a few that i've seen after the project is finished and i was damn i wish i had a hand in the actual uh executing of you know the editing and whatnot like that part the producing of it because i think that I could have uh, made some suggestions that would have helped this project out. So um, keeping that in mind, I did a uh, guest spot on a show called Love That Girl starring Tatiana Ali that was on TV One produced by Bentley Kyle Evans. Bentley Kyle Evans was executive producer of Martin and Jamie Foxx. So he, uh, after he saw me on that show, you know, you know, he, he directed it as well. And he said, man, I got a script for another series called Family Time. I'd love to sit down and talk to you about it. So we had a meeting and within the next three days, we were up and running and filming that thing. You know, and we did uh, six six episodes for the first season, cut to uh, 91 episodes later and uh, a hit show for Bounce TV. So real proud of that. And, and I got to say as well, man, that was, a, that was a phenomenal, phenomenal show, especially to have on, on just a network like Bounce TV, man, because Bounce TV isn't as big as, of course, as, of course, as like CBS and whatnot. Of course. So. Right, right. So yeah, I think it definitely brought the viewership and the ratings to that station. No, definitely, definitely, man. And it's, uh, you know, Browns TV is an over-the-air broadcast network, you know, so a lot of people don't understand what that means is it's free television. So it's in lower-income housing, uh, jail, prison, a lot of brothers locked up. I get letters and <laughs> emails and stuff like, you know, like, man, y'all made it through, you know, y'all y'all helped me out through tough times here, man, because y'all funny as hell. Yeah, you know I mean, so we, we're excited about that show, man. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to work on and then being a writer and a producer on that show as well as the lead. It was a lot of work, but uh, it was fun. It was a blessing. And also as, as well, man, aside from being a, being a, a legendary actor, producer, you were also a hip hop artist as well, man. Yes, where Talk about in it. Two, in, in 2019, you actually released the hip hop album, The Excuse under the name Big O. I yes, was sir. wondering what made you decide to venture into being a hip hop artist? And of course, where can our listeners snag themselves a copy of this phenomenal record today? All right, so check this out. Um, as I touched on earlier, my father was a singer. Uh, he passed away in 2017, the same year that my first born son was born. Right. And 
I, I was 40 years old at that time, right? So I think at around 38, me and my wife started talking about having kids and whatnot. And we, you know, got more and more serious about it. And she got pregnant and everything was great. So when she was pregnant, you start thinking about things now. Ah, talking about your kid. What would you have conversations in the future about your kid, things you used to do and such and such? And thing I'm thinking about is music. I was like, what if I'm sitting there talking to my son? And I said, man, I, you know, I could rap. And he said, oh, really? Well, where's your albums at? You know, and I thought to myself, oh, damn that. I need to put an album out that's a solo album. Now, dig this. Uh, I've always been into hip hop and I've always been a rapper. When you hear the album and hopefully after this interview, you say, oh, I got to hear this and you go check it out. You will be uh, shocked. I will say that. And I'll let you figure out for for what reason. Either, damn, I thought it'd be better or, oh, my God. Uh, but <laughs> one way or other, you're going to be shocked. And for those of you that are shocked for the good reason of, wow, I, I, I wasn't expecting that. Um, for one, music's always been in me. It's been in the blood. Entertaining has been in the blood because my parents were entertainers. Um, back when they were in the uh, R&B game, it was all about performing for your fans. If you're you know, singing in hallways and all this, getting sounding right, no auto-tune, none of that, you were getting it. When you had a live, audi live audience, a lot of it was competitions and competing. It was always working with your hands and, and choreographing and dancing. And, you know what I mean? So they gave birth to actors, entertainers. Now, my brother can sing a little bit. My sister can sing a little bit. My other brother plays bass. And I can sing and I rap. Now, I haven't dropped any uh, hip uh, <laughs> R&B albums, and I won't. Uh, <laughs> but I'll use... <laughs> I'll use the singing side in my hip hop at times. So the album that I dropped called The Excuse, um, the first song off the album, when you start, when you push play on the album, it starts off with uh, a sound bite of me and my wife. Uh, we were taking a picture with my son and I had him on my lap and his name is Omar as well. So Omar Jr. was sitting on my lap and we had those noise cancellation headphones on him just so, you know, cause I was listening to music. So we just had a pair of those for whatever reason. But I had been sitting on the couch writing this album. You know what I mean? And I'm writing this album. And I got my headphones on. And then I got my son on my lap. And my wife goes, here, why don't you put these headphones on him too? And I think it'll be really cute. And we'll take a picture of you guys both with headphones on. I was like, yeah, that'd be dope. And as soon as we put the headphones on him, he starts laughing for the first time ever. We've never heard him laugh. He's like six months old. And he'd make little noises and sounds and this and that and that, that, whatever. Woo -woo. But he'd never laughed before until we put these headphones on and just so happened she had her phone out because she was about to take a picture. So as soon as she starts laughing, she switches it over to video and starts recording. And he just has a laughing fit. And everything that I say to him, he's he's just hearing us and it sounds funny to him. So he starts giggling. So I use that sound bite to start the album. And then I go into the first song, which is called Better Me, which was written as a better version of myself. And I'm talking to my son about you'll be a better me one way or the other, <laughs> you know, and I go into lyrically talking about, you know, things to look out for and as it becomes a man and blah, blah, blah. And it's really raw. It's, you know, it's not like I'm talking to a little baby. So I'm like trying not to curse. Now nah, I'm talking to a man in my, my mind. So it's, it's, it's uncut and it's raw. You know, people hear it like, damn, this is for your son. When can he hear it? <laughs> when he's 18, <laughs> no, let, let him hear the radio version. Okay. But I get through the, the, the writing of the entire song and then I realized Every half of the stuff that I'm saying to him are things that my father said to me. So the song became a double dedicated song to both my father who had just passed and my son who was just born. You know what I mean? So that's how the album begins. And from the beginning to the end, it's only seven songs long. But by the time you get to the seventh song, you've been taken on a journey. Now, the producer of the album is Focus. People don't know who Focus is. Focus works for Aftermath and Dr. Dre. And he has Grammys. He has his handprint on just about any song that you can think of from R&B uh, through hip hop that has come through Aftermath, you know what I mean, over the last 20 some odd years. So him being a close friend of mine, he said, yeah, man, you've done now. I put out a couple other albums as well. I put out some songs, but they've all been either under groups or hidden behind other people. I and did. I remember uh, one of them was with Sibo as well. well. Exactly. Trading War Stories, Sibo. And Omar Big Old Gooding presents. You know what I mean? So my name is behind his in the catalog. So people are like, I didn't see you on that. But uh, but you you'll hear some stuff on there. Um, I did a couple other underground albums with like a couple of groups that I rolled with, but this was the first time that I put my name out there. Now, dig this. 
I released it in 2019 called The Excuse by Big O. And the cover was a hat like this, and all you see is my nose and my face doing this. Not even my eyes. And that was the cover, and it said Big O, The Excuse. Did nobody hear the mother? Because who the hell is Big O? No one knows Big me is Big O, and they couldn't see my face. Made even worse, when I put it out, when you put it in the search engine for Big O, other Big O's would pop up. So just this last year, about uh, two months ago now, matter of fact, listen here, I've re-released the album. So let's be clear. Omar Gooden, The Excuse, is out now on all digital platforms because it needs to be heard, it needs to be appreciated, and it's something I want to get off before I let y'all have this new music that I got coming because I got a lot. I got a whole lot of new stuff, man, and I'm really excited about it. So I wanted to re-release that album so people can find it. And uh, it's got a lot of slappers on there, man. I mean, by the time, again, once you get through the, by the end of the album, you've been taking on the journey. It'll start with me talking about my son and my family and talking about my, my introspectively, my career, a little bit about baby boy, a little bit about having a brother that won an Oscar. Yeah, I'm talking about. And then by the end, you hear some of my influences, like one of the rappers that I think were the greatest of all time, in my opinion, Busta Rhymes. So there's a song called Homage on there where if you listen to it and think Busta Rhymes, you'll hear kind of his, kind of the, the influence that he had on one of the styles that I use in hip hop. That's not every song. I don't do that double time super fast on every song. And matter of fact, an album is only one song that I do that on. Um, but, you know, again, it's a journey and it was a process. It was therapeutic for me and it came out solid, man. I'm really proud of it. That's why I wanted to re-release it, make sure that my fans would say, Omar Gooding, oh, I hear he raps. Yeah, put in Omar Gooding and you'll see the excuse pop up. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure my fans will, will dig that as well as the new stuff I have coming out. And, and I'm going to say this, and I'm not just going to say this because you're live on my radio station right now, but I think that album is actually a masterpiece, man. Like I, I've been listening to that for, I think since like 2020 when it first popped up and I, and I gotta say, man, phenomenal record. So I encourage everybody that is listening, whether it's live on demand, snag yourselves a copy of this record, man, because you won't be disappointed and you will be surprised. I remember <laughs> that song where you actually rapped really fast. I was sitting yeah. back. I was like, <laughs> I was like, damn, I'm like, right. he, he, he can, he can spit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now that was the one man too. And, and focus has a way of doing that. Like, all right, man, you know what I'm gonna need on this one? You know what I'm gonna need? I'm gonna need you to go ahead. Just go ahead. Write about a hundred thousand words on this one. And then he switches to beat up and I, and I keep gassing. So, uh, yeah, that was dope, man. That was dope. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna. I'm gonna put some more of those out there too, because that was one that really uh, responded. I also did a video for it too, which was uh, that I directed and well, co-directed with uh, Concrete. Shout out Concrete Live. Um, but I concepted it. He uh, he figured out a way to shoot it the way I wanted it, which was dope, man. And uh, we're really excited about that too. So yeah, check that out. Check that out. That song is called Homage. Hence the conversation about Buster Rhymes paying homage to Buster. And also as well, man. Uh, I I, I, sorry, I have to ask as well. When we're on the topic of homage, you said homage to Busta Rhymes. Like, yeah. did uh, did Busta ever comment on that record? Like, did he actually like ever like hit you up and be like, "Yo, Omar, like, yo, oh, so I, check I it. it." So check it, man. You asked some great questions. So check it. I'm in the studio, Dre's studio, you know, because I go see Focus a lot, and he'll just you know invite me down. Yeah, I'm, I'm working. Come in, you know, I'll pull up, and you just never know what you're gonna see or who's gonna be there. You have to sign a waiver as you walk in. You know, it's one of those type of things. And I remember we had we, had, we had just got the album finished and Buster Rhymes was in there, man. It was my first time meeting him. And uh, the cool thing is it was a mutual fan thing because he was like, yo, that baby boy movie was the shit. You know, and we laughing about that. And I'm like, yo, man, you already know I fucks with you, man. Matter of fact, I did a song with you and mine called Homage, man. You mind if I press play? He's like, press play, man, press play. And I played it and um, he was impressed. He was impressed. He said some humbling things, uh, you know, from from. You know, personal for me to him from him to me you know me back and uh yeah it was dope man so i mean to have that moment completed shit for me it was kind of like ah that's it all right that's cool take me now like <laughs> you know i've had a couple of those moments of like uh you know being a laker fan and meeting kobe you know what i mean being a denzel fan meet denzel that type of shit brief but like just oh uh, mm, yeah boom that's exactly what i need bam buster was cool i mean we hung for a minute uh, plus he was in there working too. So it was, it was dope. It was dope. And also the reason why you're sliding through the Canadian airwaves tonight is actually to promote mm -hmm. a new movie coming out titled 17 days. Yeah. I was wondering, man, if you can actually tell our listeners a bit more about this film. And of mm -hmm. course, what was it like just working on this project with this phenomenal cast and crew? 
Hey, let me tell you something. Um, there are a lot of up and coming producers and directors that haven't had a shot and that are finally getting that shot. This was one of those instances where I saw a script. Uh, it's about domestic violence. Uh, I play uh, an officer that actually helps solve the crime. The you know girl she's kidnapped. I don't give too way too much away about the movie itself. Um, but it's a it's a it's a good ride. It's a good message. It's a good story. It's good storytelling. Um, and from what I could tell, because I wasn't a producer on this, I, I came in late on the project, uh, but I did want to be a part of it because of the message that it sends. Um, and then, you know, they've actually reshot the, the ending, too. And they were like, you gonna love this new ending. I was like, OK, I thought I was in the ending. If you reshot it without me, it must be something different. Uh, so I don't think I was cut out the movie. <laughs> but uh, but I think I think y'all would dig it. I think y'all would dig it. I had a good time shooting it. Um, and well, the cool thing was what happened was it was my last day filming and I was walking to my car and um, one of the guys that was just, he was working on the film doing um, kind of like behind the scenes filming. He was one of the cameramen. And he said, yo, man, he's 24 years old cat. His name was Larry Murphy. He said, yo, I, I got an album out that drops tonight. Would you mind listening to one of the songs? I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he played the song for me and it blew my mind. This kid is just full of hip hop, oozing, bro. And I was like, damn, really? I said, you need to press play on my album. We need to collab and do something. And we wound up doing a song that we later titled uh, Life of the Party um, for the movie 17 Days. So if you don't have that, after this interview, I'm going to send you that so you can feel that and the video for it. Um, but that's the song that's attached to the movie. So we're, we're really excited about that because that made a lot of a lot of noise, too. We went out. Everything happened so spontaneously because this guy just happened to be walking out when I was walking out to play this. By the end of the night, we had recorded a song. I flew back in town, back in North Carolina to uh, do a club appearance. I put another verse on there. We went to a block party, performed the song at the block party, went to the nightclub, brought the cameras in. So we wound up having a whole video shot for this. So we released the video. Well, we're going to release the video right before the movie drops as well. So we're excited. But I think the movie itself, um, from the producers, the writing, the cast on down is phenomenal. Um, it's one of the things that I'm proud of as far as storytelling. storytelling. So I haven't seen the finished product yet. So they, the editor dropped the ball. It ain't on me. No, no, no. Full, full disclosure, full disclosure. I haven't seen the finished product, but from the script that I read and the time on set, I think people will enjoy this film. Um, and the music is going to be phenomenal. I've heard a couple other songs off this soundtrack. This thing is dope. That's what's dope about this era that we're in now. You know what I mean? You can get ex as excited about the soundtrack as you can about the movie nowadays. That's why I do both. It's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> but no, speaking of that song, Life of the Party, man, I actually yeah. have about a 20, about a 25 second clip of this music nope. video that I'm nope. actually going to play for us live. Oh, no. People. Okay, good. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm trying so to that's what I was to... trying to. I'm glad I was able to kind of talk that up how it happened, too, because it looked like we took our time planning this out. And that is it. It happened in like a weekend. It was insane. I flew in on a Friday. We did a studio session, filmed that. Saturday morning, we went did a, to a block party. So, you see me in the video interacting with fans, performing on stage. You see us in the studio rapping, and you see us at a nightclub, and I'm signing autographs and hanging out with people. And that's where that whole thing came about. So it was it was dope, man. Shout out to North Carolina and everybody put that out. So DJ what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin yeah. this little clip. That way people can check it out. And we, we, we'll be right back in about 20 seconds. Let's do it. Now if you still don't know about me, let me tell you more about me. I'm the life of the party and I bet your moms ain't forgotten. <laughs> See, I'm nasty but copy. I still be your ass up probably. Don't get out of pocket when you out in the bout and spot me. Cause I'm just not the type to be still cool if you ain't nice to me. I'm Captain Petty. I stay ready to bust that right for me. Knock it off. Grown now. Still find a ways to pop it off. Long life. Still find a ways to shock them all. And I'm just getting started. Is you done? My not at all. Hey! Great fire, man. Hey. I'm, I'm excited to see that whole music video. Oh, you got to, man. As a matter of fact, I leaked it. Really? Yeah, so if you follow Omar Gooding on uh, on Instagram, just, just keep scrolling. You'll see it's on there. It's on there. I'm and not going to lie. Channel, I've I been following you since I first joined my Instagram on 2019. Oh, I, no. I, I feel like, I've, as a fan, I cheated here, man. I feel like I should have known about this. Hey, <laughs> hey, it's on there. It's on there, I'm telling you. I'm just funny, too, when people say things like, man, how are your kids doing? I'll be like, oh, you don't follow me on, on the ground? Because I keep putting them up. But you mean, 
I'm about to pull one up right now. Just go ahead and say hi to the people. <laughs> and it's easier for me than always seeing somebody having to go, well, they're pretty good. Well, this and that. that, that. Can I see a picture? I'm like, you ain't following me on the gram because they all over it. <laughs> no, but uh, but I try to keep people abreast of what I'm doing too. You know, and it's so funny too. Is I go out, people say things like, oh man, I ain't seen you in a minute. What you been on? Because I got a show uh, called uh, Family Time. We, oh man, that's my shit. I love that. I thought you just said you ain't, <laughs> you know. So some people just want to have something to say. But uh, but I keep working. I keep I, I I stay busy, and I try to do things that my fans will appreciate. You know what I mean? Um, there's some things you can't control when you read the script and you're like, yes, this is gonna be great. And you see the movie and you're like, oh my god, what happened? Shout out to editors. Now I did a movie. I want to shamelessly plug a film that called AM Radio that is still out right now on Amazon Prime. It was my pandemic film. Let me get serious here for a second. When you watch this movie, and you will go watch this movie, if you are a fan of Omar Gooding, let me get in the third person on y'all real quick. If you are a fan of Omar Gooding, you must see this film because I'm giving you something else. And I'm also taking you back to a time that where we all were, where uncertainty ruled our brains. We did not know what was going to come next for all of us. The movie is about a guy that works at an AM radio station that's a shut-in. He's a recluse, and he doesn't deal with a lot of what's going on now. He's kind of caught in his ways, but he's very knowledgeable. He's read a lot of books. So the movie appealed to me during this time where I was uncertain about the future of entertainment because all my agents and lawyers were saying, look, it's, Hollywood's going to be shut down for a couple of years. And I had this deal in place that was put on hold because of the pandemic. So we kind of went around everybody else has said look we need to make this movie we need to do it right now so i had the full pandemic beard the hair had my hair was long and twist bone you know and it was a guy in a booth by himself so we were able to keep everything safe and closed in and i was able to pour my heart and soul into this movie and during the filming of it turn on cnn george floyd next day i'm filming the scene like you know what i mean I, come on now some of my finest work by far. I mean, I watch it and go, go ahead, brother. Like, <laughs> now, I don't know if 17 Days is that good, because that's what he's always talking about, but AM radio? No. Just keeping it a buck. But for me, the best part about the movie, which is what you guys won't know, is that I was a producer and an editor on this. Like, I was able to give my feedback after watching the first cut and see changes to the movie made and see it start from here and get to here. You know what I mean? So when I talk about editors, I keep talking about, oh, when I was when I was when I read it, I did my scene and left. No, nah, mother. I stayed to watch and make sure everything was cut short. All right, we need to bring that in, slide that over. Let's replace that with this. Let's bring the sound up here. You know, but shout out to Ricky Bushell, who um is a mastermind. He is a genius. He reminds me of the late great John Singleton because he does it all up here. He does it all. He's writing it directing it editing it color scheming sound <laughs> brothers he started as a rapper you feel me so the music's on point the score on point. oh so we got a couple other projects with him and i too I also did a uh, documentary called my name is omar gooding but we'll talk about that on the next interview Hey man, but but I gotta I gotta ask one thing because I don't want to make this all pandemic type stuff. And when you brought that up, the one thing I gotta ask because me personally, I'm a movie buff. I love movies. Clearly, you know what I mean by some of the stuff I asked. Sure. So I, I just have to bring this up, man. Like, how did the pandemic really affect you you guys on set? Like, how, did it really change yeah. your experience on how you guys really did your work? Like, one thousand percent distancing and whatnot. Let me tell you this. So let me try to not be as long winded as I because I, I can be long with. Um. Initially, the pandemic hit everyone, I think, the same. That's what the bringing together thing was, where, you know, you're spending, no matter what your situation was with your family and your friends, you had to hunker down and not be in contact with a lot of people, right? You didn't know what was going to happen with your jobs, with our jobs, and every and just in every profession, you got to think about it. Some people lost their jobs. Some people lost a lot more. A lot of people lost their lives and their livelihood. Um, so with us, with me personally, because you're asking me, I'm gonna ask her for myself. I knew that there was other, there were, uh, how honest am I gonna be? Let's like, we get to the end, let's get there. <laughs> um, there's two ways to work in my industry. You understand me? Um, and it's not really a right way and a wrong way, it just is what it is. I don't care what profession you do, there's always, you can do this, 
Or you go, oh, since you got a name, you kind of do this too. You know what I mean? So the lines kind of blurred because if I think I listened to what my team was saying, I wouldn't have worked for two years straight and who knows what. But I said, nah, there's other work and there's this and that. There's writing, there's being creative, there's this, there's that. There's, you know, so I went that way and it opened up a whole new world of possibilities and rec directing and, and um, producing and editing and sound score and this and that and different financial gain way. You know what I mean? So many other things for me. So it was such a blessing in disguise. Like personally, like right away, you're at home more. You're spending time with, with things and people that you would take for granted normally. You know, like a walk, the neighborhood, the air, getting more exercise, just, you know, a lot of things. So the pandemic was really very important for that reason. Um, now, as it starts back, what happened was I don't audition as much, you know, anymore. But I st I'm not proud in that sense because people go, oh, man, oh, you, I know. I'm sorry, Omar. Do you mind putting yourself on tape? I'm like, oh, hey, I want to know what I look like. I get it. it was, we want to just give you an offer. And I get offers, which is fine. But there was an audition process and it started all over again. Now, dig this. The way the game changed is that now actors and actors that are watching this, pay attention because this is now the game. You are being judged by how well you can work a computer. <laughs> or a cell phone or follow fucking directions because they're not gonna, now they're going damn we told him to make sure it was well lit and we can hear you and we can't hear this motherfucker next it's like damn but he's acting his ass off he's crying and all this shit fuck him he's stupid i've literally experienced this not to me but in one of my cast members who almost didn't cast in a project we did because they didn't have their technical stuff down and I talked to the producers about it. And I was like, what was the holdup on casting this role? And they were like, well, we were trying to get them to do this and blah, blah, blah. And I had to talk to them and say, come on, let them try it again. And they tried it again and they had everything right and they, they nailed it. But on the other side of the camera, they're looking, they're trying to make their decisions on who to cast for the role. And they're like, why is it you know, next, next? I don't want to sit here and tell you, know, everybody else has got it. It's perfect. I can see him clearly. They're fine. They might not be that good, but at least I can hear them and understand them. So I want to cast this person because they're smarter than this person that looks better and sounds better, but I can't tell because it sounds bad. And it, you know what I mean? <laughs> the game has changed. That's so, so weird, though. Even my wife, who is not in act in in a, an entertainer, her job was she, her her profession. She would go into work. Now she's working from home because her industry is finding out that they didn't need half of this shit. Why are we paying for parking tab and all these cubicles and all this other shit? We don't need it. We're getting our job done. Stay at home. Things is changing everywhere. So. Our business has changed in the auditioning process. You have to learn how to work a camera and be able to work, <laughs> sell yourself up in here with it. You know what I'm talking about? Know your angles and shit. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to, you boom, you got to work it. I used to hate self-tape. Oh, I used to hate it because I was like, come on, I'm, I'm the king at working a room. How you doing? Look you in the eye. Talk about your shoes. Hey, hey, I can't see shit in this camera shit. All I see is me. Bounce back at me. So I remember I auditioned uh, for a new show, and um, we're still working out the kinks in that, so I don't want to get into too much details with it, but it's a big deal. It's a Disney show. Great. And I, when I auditioned the first time, I was like, I know I'm killing this, but I don't hear shit. But it was a Zoom interview. So right when it ended, I was just like, oh, all right, you guys good? And they all clicked in one at a time. Like, oh, my God, that was great. And I was like, was it? I couldn't tell. Because usually when I do comedy, I hear people laughing. They're like, well, we were all on mute. So we couldn't laugh with you. But we, as soon as it was done, we'd unmute and go, man, that was great. Good job. Man, you look good. This and that. Hey, da 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 da. And I was like, oh, shit, okay. And I learned there. But, you know, I always, you know, you thank God I've, you know, been in this long enough. You don't let the reactions of the crowd deter how you perform. You know what I mean? So I just banged through it. Like, I know that's funny. Y'all better be laughing on the inside because I'm going to just push to the next joke. And I know you're laughing at that, so I'm going to keep it pop. You know what I mean? And I just kept going through it. But in the back of my mind, I'm going, what the fuck is going on? I don't hear nothing, you know? So the game has changed. Directors, executives, producers, they are hiring people based lar in large part to their knowledge on how to work a camera. So don't tell them how long it took for us to get connected on this because I couldn't download the rest. <laughs> don't tell nobody about how long it took. For this to start, I thought you was starting at eight. I was in there going, hey, hey no, but I got, it, I got it. In my in Canadian time, it was only two minutes. Okay, 
<laughs> but I have to ask, man, like, just, just with that, just with that, like how you said they're basing you on a camera. Do you think it when or if this coronavirus ever disappears, which hopefully one day it will, do you think it might go back to kind of like the how 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 every other actor is used to auditioning, or do you think they're going to keep the whole Zoom aspect? I just think things have changed because you realize that you don't, at least in their eyes, you don't. If I don't have to be there, I'm not going. Why am I flying out and we're spending this money on these, you know, flying these guys in here, blah, blah, blah. When I could just say send a tape in or we'll do a Zoom chat or we'll blah, 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 blah. We can do it from here, you know. And they're casting people from the – here up. How you – we'll do a full slate <laughs> later, but you got that roll off my shoulders and up. It was amazing. <laughs> people could no, – They'll do the full can, body. Can, can but be but auditioning movie. in their underwear or some shit. Right. <laughs> like, they would be like, just stand up. Oh, shit. Oh, sit back down. No, but <laughs> – but yeah, it, it's definitely changed. I don't, I don't, I, I just think the way that they've cut so many corners and still been able to come away with effective product as, as of now, uh, I don't think that'll change, man. I remember how the acting game changed for a while where I was mad. And it's so funny, man. I don't know. I'm just giving you something right now. I was mad at rappers for a long time being an actor because there was an era where act where rappers were getting all the actors roles. Just because they had a following and can sell some records and shit, they put them in front of the camera and giving them and fucking up movies just to give such and such a fucking lead role in this. I'm like, the fuck? Like, why? And thank God that died out and this shit is real getting real. I mean, it's kind of like the state of hip hop where it kind of got weird and, you know, partying and kids was dying off drugs. Just crazy. I mean, not that it's completely stopped, but it got bad for a moment. And it seems like the lyrical content is getting back to the hip hop that I love. So I'm excited about that. But I just think the entertainment industry acting wise is kind of doing the same thing where it's kind of filtering out the bullshit. Now, you know, you have the internet sensations that are kind of getting their shot and whatnot, but you still have to be able to bring it now, which is, whew, thank God it's, 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 it's getting real. But I have to ask Omar, what is next for yourself, man? Because I do know, like this year alone, aside from seventeen mm -hmm. days in we man, mm -hmm. you, you've been dropping consistently, like working like nonstop, yeah. man. So I have yeah. to ask the stuff you can talk about, and you're allowed to, because I know contract wise yeah. negotiations. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want to get you, and I don't want to yeah. get you any type of shit. But yeah. what is next for yourself? The, the stuff that you can talk about. What's next for the That's one and only Omar? So, let's see. So after I did AM radio. Me and Ricky Michelle did a um, a documentary about the 90s that evolved into a documentary about myself, <laughs> which was weird to do. But it was cool because, you know, I was able to bring my brother in and he shared and go to my mom's house. And she talked and took people around her museum house where she loves it. Look, and this is the picture because she kept she keeps everything. So it's awesome. Uh, my sister, who has a steel trap memory of just, oh, I'll tell you about this and that, you know, and then close friends of mine and this and that. And then, um, you know, Darius and actor friends of mine and, and kind of take that walk down memory lane and tell people about inside stories about uh, the 90s, about a lot of these shows and sitcoms. People say, oh, man, you, I grew up watching you. I was like, yeah, well, let me tell you what happened behind the scenes, that type of stuff. So, uh, so that was fun, man. So that's, uh, again, that's called My Name is Omar Gooding. And we'll get into that. I said, we, we, we got to do another interview, man. Uh, but that's dope. I'm really excited about that one. Uh, one More Dream is another one that he did uh, that I, I helped produce. And I did a little cameo in that one. So that's 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 kind of cool. But there's a movie called Teachers Watching. Now, we did a remake on um, Fatal Attraction. But we modernized it. And it's, um, it's a biracial couple. Uh, the mother... The wife uh, loses her mother. We move, we uproot the family for a fresh start, and then the husband has an affair with the teacher of the daughter. And then she winds up being crazy, and then tries to kill everybody. I feel attraction, but it's a new version of it. Um, but it was really well written. Uh, we filmed it out of Mississippi at a spectacular time. Another great, phenomenal cast, great uh, production team. I was uh, really happy to be a part of that. I'm happy that you guys are seeing that. Um, that should be out by middle of next year. Um, a movie that I'm beginning in about. I said, well, I don't want to talk about the stuff I'm about to do. I'm about to, I'm going to talk about the stuff that's in the can because there's, there's, so, <laughs> there's so many things. In the Man, did you bring up the? Yes, hold on. So I should have wrote this down. I usually do that. I get too much things going on. Um, what else do we have? So we have uh, 17 days. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's going to be a dope one. Uh, Guns and Grams. That's another we did a premiere for. Shout out to this one. You know, gritty Baltimore joint. My fans be happy about that one. Um, the Perfect Wedding, 
That's a good one. Uh, I play the romantic lead kind of do so it's, I get to do the charming thing and the you know, and sexy thing and all that type of stuff. Lick your lips. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's, you know, some I got some grown and sexy stuff coming. Um, and hell up in music. And a bunch of things as soon as we finish this, I'm like, damn, I should have plugged that. Like I said, I usually write this stuff down, but I was kind of going flying, free from the cup. But, uh, but I got a lot of things that I've produced and a lot of music that I've produced and recorded. So, uh, man, y'all gonna get sick of me in a minute. But I got a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff coming. I'm gonna just keep Pouring it out because I'm doing it for the fans now. The fans of my kids. My kids are excited. They're seeing me on screen and going, Is that daddy up there? You know, I'm showing them smart guy and they laughing and they're getting it. And he's five, like, damn, man, you watching TV like that, you know. And the youngest is two, and he's following him, going, Yeah. So um, so it's cool to kind of keep pumping stuff up now uh for them. Where I was kind of more like I said, I was talking about the other shows that you get fat, just chilling, like, man, I ain't doing no no. Now it's just it feels like I'm a revitalized having kids at 40, and I'm just like, all right, man, let me work out for them and uh, you know, get some stuff for them. So that they can they can enjoy this longevity, and as I see the personality popping out in them, I already know where this is going. So I'm like, well, let me get all my stuff out the way, and I can just watch y'all and produce y'all and direct y'all. I already see Gooding. It's in, it's in you. It's either in you or it ain't. And with Gooding, it's just in you. It just is what it is. Hey, definitely taking after their dad and their uncle as well, man. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> hey, he got some fire for y'all too, man. He got some writing in behind and in front, and a new role he's doing that's gonna you know, blow people's wig piece. So. I'm excited, I'm excited, man. I've been a fan of yourself and, and, and your brother, Cuba, man, for many, many years, man. When I when I was a youngster, man, Snow Dogs was my shit. <laughs> <laughs> you the second dude that told me that it was dead ass serious. Like, no, I'm serious. Snow Dogs, man. Straight up, man. That's no. That's no. Honestly, but because back then your Disney was slowly starting to get in. It sounds bad to say that. The bull, the bull crap. You know what I mean? So that, right, you know, right, right, right. that was personally one, in my opinion, one of the last good real life action that's movies that actually that's came dope. out that was that was good man like that's dope he'll be happy to hear that because he used to say people say man i loved you in snow dogs he'd be like oh you trying to sell some shit <laughs> what you trying to say bro i was like no i loved you because people say that to me but why man i love you while the crazy kids i'm like oh really i ain't I'm, i ain't no kid no more oh wait you're serious oh shit well come on get out <laughs> people grew up watching these shows man and it was, it was fun to be a part of it. you know what i mean and i can always tell a person's age when they say what show what show they bring up you know what I mean? Well, would you would you like that one? Oh yeah, you about thirty, huh? Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> but I gotta say, first and foremost, Omar, it's about twelve twenty a.m. here on the East Coast, man. <laughs> so you know, I'm pretty sure we're both tired. You know what I yeah. mean? But yeah. I gotta say, first and foremost, man, I, I gotta save some content for our next for our next interview. Absolutely. But before we part ways, man, if you can, for the people that aren't already following you on the gram and all the other social media yeah. handles, you can yeah. drop them handles that way our listeners can follow you. Yeah. And stay, stay updated on everything. That's exactly only. right, man. I don't. I, I'm not hiding anything anymore. Like, and you got to find big old dot this dot that. No, no. Omar Gooding. Instagram. Start there. At Omar Gooding. Um, Omar Gooding music on my YouTube. Uh, Facebook is the Omar Gooding. Um, and that's it, man. Just look. Put Omar Gooding in, and you will find me because that's what's going down. That's my music, my acting, my directing, my producing, and my daddy days. Because you know, that's what it is. You know about. And I got to say, first and foremost, like I said at the beginning of the interview and before we went live, just while I have you here, man, thank you for years and years of monumental entertainment that not only myself, but I can speak for the millions of fans that do happen to watch this. Just amazing entertainment, man, from, you know, your yeah. movies to, you know what I mean, to Smart Guy. Thank you for just giving us years of laughter, seriousness, mm -hmm. and of course, your blood, sweat, and tears on the screen, man. We definitely yeah, appreciate yeah. you, and thank you, man, so much. Well, you are welcome. That's all I got to say. You are welcome. <laughs> I'm, look, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to it. I'm doing it for a long time, time, man. It's all I know, man. So I'm gonna keep doing. It. I got nothing, nothing else to do but to do it. You know what I'm talking about? Hey, man. man I appreciate we're, you, brother. We're definitely looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Omar. Right and on. definitely have yourself a wonderful night. Thank you. You too, man.